taboo. Uh, and as uh, Josh made it clear, they do a lot of things, and so does he, lots of different things. Um, and the Japanese band, The Pacements, uh, have an out of this world adventure. Um, the, uh, the author of Words I'm Not Allowed to Say, Corey Schrader, age nine, says, I did a re book report on the first issue and got an A. The story was a very Beatle, has a very Beatles-esque setup and is literally described as a storyboard for an upcoming feature film. Uh, issues one and two are back there on this front corner. Um, uh, it will look awesome. And uh, it's in promotion for an upcoming tour uh, produced by Rebel Santa Media. And our uh, next one up after this intermission is Michael Serralo. And much of his work is about place, both physical and historical. Let's give it up for Michael. This first poem is almost 30 years old, and sadly it's still applicable today and probably will be so for the foreseeable future. The American Dream. The sign in the store window said, lotto tickets sold here. And the people lined up for their chance at the dream. If Marie Antoinette had only had the foresight to say, let them buy lottery tickets. <laughs> uh, this next one was written uh, before the current president took office, but it applicable to him as well. Summit meeting. The leaders all look incredibly lifelike. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, so rest I'm going to read are from my book, 500 Cleveland Haiku, that Az published back in April. Uh, you can Pleasure. come and see me after. <laughs> Gull hovers over the lake. No choice for him but to eat poisoned fish. <laughs> Government buildings named for politicians who aren't even dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> Without hesitation, he would give you the shirt off my back. <laughs> Inspiration. I love the smell of carcinogens in the morning. <laughs> I think I'll end with this one. A store sign. <coughs> God bless America. Beer and wine in the state minimum. <laughs> 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 Familiar, volatile, sulfuric. 
The orange creamsicle glow filtered onto the stove top and struck the brass teapot. I noticed the glinting of dew on the windowsill while the kitchen fern unfurled to the scan of the curio cabinet. A haze of smoke mingled with the scent of burning flesh as the alarm began to sound. The white-tailed rabbit, the clumsy soul that he was, dropped a basket of glittering eggs at his feet, cracking yolks the size of a pushpin. A befuddled salamander snapped his g-string in the middle of a Spanish ballad while the other mud dwellers began to pray. Triplets, the blonde ones with spilt milkmaid braids, wailed in three-part harmony. Even the clam opened his jagged mouth and spat pearls at the glass of the lustrous mortar. Again, I forgot that the oven was on, that I was making a sick casserole for dinner. I forgot what fire was used for and the feeling of hunger. I forgot her name and then my own. Let me unknow everything that keeps me grounded here. Strip me of everyone who dares to speak me back into existence. Forget me, for I am but a god of half-animate objects. I tried to lie like a statue, motionless, unchanging, quiet. If I just reduce myself to rubble, she has nothing left to take from me. Only a figure keeps in my frame. 
enchant me with your light bulb dowry. The vertex is an overlapping hexagon and sepia rose tone, yet none of us know how to drive a stick. Go down on me, your other star brother, in the root sick black walnut backyard. Sloth is my second favorite sin. Patience is my second favorite virtue. Doorstep of an old witch 
who lived in the bottom of the mountain when he was 12, and she'd gone and cursed him for life. Wheeler said it was just a joke. The witch thought differently. <laughs> uh -huh. When he was 21, he refused to work in the mines or on the mountain roads. And he climbed upon the cold steel shoulders of locomotives as they shrugged off their rest in shipping yards and lurched and screeched toward another nap down the track. And he smoked and slept and dreamed of his next meal and his next drunk and his next whore. And he did not brush his teeth because dental care was not provided to hobos. And by the time he was 35, they were brown. And by the time he was 40, they were gall. And by the time he was 50, he looked 77, and he was tired, too tired to ride the rails another mile. And he walked with a limp and a lurch and a hunch in his back, and he was thin, and I think he was tall in his youth, and he still smoked filthy with cigarettes that he rolled himself with homegrown tobacco with fingers staying yellow from the harvest. And he laughed a risk, raspy, slithery skin of hot tires across loose gravel, and he flirted with his cause just a little too intimately to remain inconspicuous about fulfilling the Southern prophecy regarding sisters and cousins. And he became convinced that his blood had all dried up in his very veins because he lost all sensitivity to pain, and he was free. And he was free from con conventions and reforms. He was free from schools and fields of tobacco. He was free from nights of tempting death. He was free from agony and the perception of abandonment. He was free from education and constructed wisdoms. And I was just a boy from up north, seated all quiet and cabin on a metal folding chair in the basement of First Baptist Church of Cumberland Gap at the funerary reception of my great aunt Bertha, who I had never met. But I heard that she was a large woman who always took a chicken killing hatchet and chopped the heels off a new pair of shoes before she would wear them. And I was watching Wheeler drink dandelion wine from a plastic cup over a metal folding table as he talked and laughed and remembered his lost youth with a slice of homemade cheesecake sitting in front of him and flies buzzing around the rim of my soda. And I thought to myself, that man is going to die. And that was a Thursday. And grass was growing tall on Tennessee Mountainside Cemetery, holding the bones of deacons and pastors and their wives, some of my family, and about to grant eternal rest to my great Aunt Bertha, who I had never met, but whose casket required the labor of eight pallbearers to deliver it safely from the church to the hearse and from the hearse to the grave. And on Sunday, Lacey Jane said, standing in the slanting afternoon sun of a southern kitchen, rededicated to the north during the second big bang with particles of dust dancing in her every breath, he died in her colloquial Tennessee draw. We just saw him last week when we was down home for Mama's feet. He said his shoulder was hurting him, but I sure didn't think it was anything serious, and now he's gone back. They said it was cancer already gone to the bone. They're Catholic, aren't they? That was her blonde-haired brother, whose southern drawl had been all but lost to the less sonorous accents of the northern Midwest, the seventh of a family of red-haired Irish-American Indians, nearly blind, but with a pretense of intelligence and a cock of his head, he impressed the rest of the brood enough to inject his observations. They sure, I and mean, that's a long few long. We have to make another trip down home for them. Wheeler was a Catholic son under, under-medicated, over-medicated, self-medicated, undone and dead, and they returned to the mountains for another <coughs> funeral, and I awoke from my occasional coma intermittently, 
remembering my children's futures and re-remembering their dreams, and it is mournful, and it was slow, and white flowers fluttered in a soft breeze just outside the window, and they contained within their perfumed flesh the presences of others whose lives I loved, and whose flesh I bruised, and whose bones I broke in the dust and ashes of long winter days, and whose return I need too deeply for words, but who are <coughs> gone, and whose goneness has become my convalescence, and my purgatory, and the com completion of my transience. And I flee into the sunset of my ego, and into the church father's promise of transcendence. And I see the burlap sacks from my childhood standing around the bed on which countless predecessors have spent countless years convalescing and countless hours dying in direct defiance of relentlessly emerging suicidal tendencies that remind us of our generally abject state and the immense confederacy of lawyers and cops and fathers and churches and courts that spent every moment trying to conquer our minds and the tiny, fearful creatures gathering themselves together for safety against the great and dangerous ubermensch of Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, who they have never met, but whose anti Messiah, whose anti-Christian brethren will be rising from the tombs of small-town churchyard cemeteries, giving them another Messiah to impale on the last lynching sliver of mountain light. And now it was my turn. Burlap sacks filled with sawdust, looking on with eyes overflared, flowing with dreams. They were all 40 or 50 years old, but they looked pretty much the same. Burlap doesn't generally alter noticeably over time, unless it's overused and under-medicated. A few of them were distinguishable from the burlap of their youth, yet largely still the same. And there isn't enough mental activity in sawdust to create the level of anxiety necessary to induce the characteristics of age. They mourned to one degree or another in direct accord with the conventions of the meta narrative imposed upon us by our drunken beach rat community on the northern waters, painted gray and green in the mirrors of land and factory smoke, populated largely by southern immigrants who came looking for a better life. But all they found was work in a big mill town and trailer park running across downriver fields, running roughshod over all the dreams of youth. And the very wind, at first light, whistling the dirge of sirens and clock-punching compounds, and the swan song of all hope and of all human strength in one relentless vision of torpor, characterized most notably by ugliness and stupidity, and satisfaction with hand-me-down dreams and white clapboard houses rising up out of graveyards like mon monuments to the dead who deliver us to the bus stop of our youth and the port authority of our age and who frown upon us from the presence of angels and saints as we abandon the narratives that have left us ragged and weeping in our divinely ordained places in the Catholic schoolboy processions, and the cathedral pews, and the communions line, and the general republic of Plato, and of his forms, and of his gods, and of the gods, and of the dying, and of the dead. Our gods, and the dying, and the dead. And in a moment of relative clarity, I heard two of them whispering. Remember that time he tipped that canoe over with all that boys? It was paddling down the river. There was one girl in there, too. I think he did it on purpose. He was mad at that old boy. Carl was his name. Yeah, he was. So he put them all in a drink, including himself, just to get back to that old car. I heard them laugh quietly. I slipped slowly back into the safety of my car. 
Yes. All right, so this first piece is called Howard Street. Mid-April in Northeast Ohio, she's bitter at the cold for overstaying its welcome. The snow obscures the line between the sidewalk and the double strip. There's a long line of determined footprints punched into the snow behind her. Halfway through a song and a cigarette, the CD skips figures. These library discs never played for shit. She balls her fists and whacks her Walkman. Across the street, in a white beater and sweatpants, two people watches from his front porch, sipping vodka and orange juice from a chip mug, world's greatest dad. In his driveway sits a 97 Cavalier with, plastic wrap, with a plastic wrap passenger window. He's hoping holds up to the wind. Will this ever end? He says to himself toward the falling snow. A passerby might think he meant the weather. Next door, she's been up all night with her newborn tornado siren, fruitlessly singing lullabies off key. Six cup of cups of coffee keep her from collapsing into a pile of dirty laundry. She thinks about herself as a kid. She thinks about how she used to walk with her eyes closed, how she used to like the thrill of it, the uncertainty and doubt of it. This is like that, she tells herself. She almost believes it. Narcan party. <laughs> they found him lying on a bug infested mattress, rubber band around his right arm, cell phone in his left hand, text message half written, never sent, simply says, I don't. He was gone when we got there, when they got there. The older man and the rookie went quickly to work. The older man filled the syringe, handed it over. The rookie pushed the plunger down like a quarter into an arcade cabinet trying for a second life, hoping his timer didn't run out, the longest second passed. The color returned to his face. He took a labored breath in and moaned incoherently like the lucky-ass zombie he was. This was the third time in as many days they performed this miracle at this house, first dad, then mom, now son, the older man says to the rookie as they share a cigarette. Penny, for your thoughts? The rookie wants to tell him about the well in his heart, and that how every time he goes on one of these calls, he imagines drawing up a bucket of water from that well, and that lately that bucket has been coming up with less and less water, and he's terrified of the day it comes up empty. But instead, the rookie replies, you know, it costs more to make a penny now than a penny's even worth. Mm. Just a um, second. Yeah, just a second, though. Um, so everybody knows April is National Poetry Month, right? Yeah. So this poem I wrote uh, with performances like this in mind. It's called April is for Fools and Poets. 
April is a month for thunderstorms and polite applause at open mics for fools and poets alike. If you attend a reading such as this and squint your eyes hard enough and open your ears wide enough, you might be able to convince yourself that you can tell the difference. This time, this time of year, all over the country, in coffee houses, bars, galleries, living rooms, and sometimes hallways or even sidewalks, the question we ask ourselves most often is, do we clap? Or, or snap our fingers? Or sit in contemplative silence, awaiting for the opportunity to pounce on the spotlight like a house cat? Read the poem, but also read the room, and listen, my friend, to the poets and the fools. For they, come, they came here to say something, just like you, and just like you, they don't know who is who. April is a month for thunderstorms and polite applause, applause and open mics for fools and poets alike. And for those seeking it, the truth is this. All poets are fools with origami hearts who have taken up fire eating as a hobby. Nice. <laughs> um, back into the press and crap. Uh, Woo! Yes! Uh, this is actually uh, originally written as a footnote to a poem called All American, but it stands alone as its own thing, too. So this is a footnote to All American, or Re Orlando. Their bodies had yet to cool into corpses. Their cell phones were still singing in their pockets with mothers, brothers, sisters, fathers, sons, and daughters on the other ends of those ropes, holding on to holy hope was holy hope as city of hearts were suspended mid-beat. And the news was already blathering about what this might mean for the upcoming election. Is this where we've arrived? Is this what we've become so comfortably numb? We follow this script, we know it by heart, we point our fingers so righteous and smart and scream about walls and quarantine and them and us. We sharpen our tongues to duel about guns and their rights, but somehow we forget that the first act in this play is supposed to be one of empathy. What happened to us? Once united in the dust of fallen buildings, now in the face of another, yet another catastrophe, we can barely shed a tear as we ready ourselves for another uncivil war. I watch this all play out again and again and again. This poem is about what happened in Orlando, but it could have easily have been any of them. The ones that we've stopped hashtagging about and the ones still beyond the horizon. <coughs> I can't help but wonder if future uh, students of 21st century American tragedy will mix up dates and names like revolutionary war battles. Was Sandy Hook the black church of the gay nightclub? Was Trayvon uh, uh, killed by a cop or a, rat or a radical extremist? Was that one the white lone wolf or the brown domestic terrorist? Who said I can't breathe and what was the context except for forget shit, I'm gonna fail this test. We are failing this test, America. We are letting the fear into our bones. We are letting it boil into anger. They are cooking us alive. They have told us the recipe time and time again. How are we still in their cauldron with their broth acting like we think it's bathwater, like it's going to clean off the blood from our hands? Haven't we learned this lesson too many times already? in the bathroom mirror, and, the, on the, and on the other side glimpses an old man he never thought he'd become. He spends a moment reflecting upon the reflection, inspecting uh, his tattered temple for signs of life. A dull ache has settled, uh, settled a home in his bones. A weight of excess years has gathered at his core and begun to fold him downward to the earth. His back on a good day transcribes telegraphs from a distant pulsing star. Time has been both generous and brutal. The slow tectonic shifting of his skin has warped the shape of his artful scars, just like his mama said it would. The heart on his right arm has a thick black ribbon wrapped around it, the names of his children listed underneath in order of their births. Uh, read his ink in layers, like tree rings or sedimentary rock. Under that ribbon is the name of his second wife. Under that heart, farther back in time, is his first in his first, a crude marijuana leaf scrapped into his arm with a homemade tattoo gun. His body has for years been a temple ruined by many vices and vocations. His permanent, he has permanent bags under his eyes and a beer belly. His feet beat for decades against hard factory floors. His heart beat for decades for even harder women. A knock on his door snaps him back into now. Daddy, Daddy, are you done yet? I need to pee. 
<laughs> no, he replies with a smile, more directed at the old man in the mirror than the toddler on the other side of the door. Not yet. That was for my dad. The newly emptied hoarder's house feels lonely. There are clean squares of carpet marking where the boxes were obsessively st uh, stacked in neat high towers. The backyard is full of rain woman ruined childhood keepsakes, blurry Polaroids of ghosts, and way too many boxes of ink, ble ink bleeding love letters never sent. Our highways are littered with stories of what could have been shattered on the, uh, shattered on the cruel asphalt of this stubborn perpetual now. We are all victims of nostalgia, cobbling together this mix of self from what remains of who we were yesterday. But memory is often misremembered, and history is a book with too many missing chapters and unreliable narrators. Despite our best efforts, we are not at all good at keeping things. The newly emptied hoarder's house feels hopeful. The foyer is no longer unusable. You can breathe and not gag on the thick atmosphere of ammonia. The front yard has freshly cut grass. For the first time in forever, you can see where a garden can grow. There's a swing set out there with chains that are rusted from years of neglect, but we know it's not unfixable. Nothing is unfixable. We are all survivors of the past, given a choice every day about what to keep and what to throw away, about who we are today and what relationship we have with the things we left on the endless road behind us. Tomorrow is a terrifyingly perfect white page streaming at us all, daring us to make some mark upon it. Take up the challenge and make it new, but remember as you do that we are not at all good at keeping things. Because things aren't meant to be kept. Send your love letters while there is still love in them. The newlywed's first home feels like possibility. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah.